going to show you the most dangerous district in Saigon. Wow, wow, we wow. Is there anything like this in, in Glasgow? Let's see how many we can see on one bike. Uh, the record, I think I've seen five or six. <laughs> Get ready for this. <laughs> Jesus. It feels wrong on every level. On traffic. It's so crazy. People playing video games while they're driving. Wow. Let's see if we can find something technical while driving. Alright, so we're driving through a pretty amazing market right now. The road rage doesn't exist here. I love showing people around Saigon. The Avengers building. So that building straight ahead is the tallest building in Southeast Asia. What we're looking at right now, like most of these buildings, that's District 1. Yeah. Good morning, Moshe. Welcome back to the biggest city in Vietnam. We are in Saigon. It is an early morning right now. And we've got a freaking crazy video for you guys today. In part of trying to uncover all these amazing stories that Vietnam has, we have linked up with a cool man named Neil. Hello. How you doing, Neil? Good, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And Louis. Hey. Can you tell me a little bit about you and what um, you're doing here? Yes, yeah, so I've lived here in Saigon now for seven years. And I follow a common expat tale where I came here for seven weeks, just a short trip, got absolutely hooked with the place, the energy, and seven weeks turned to seven years, and here I am, and it's an awesome city, so I'm really excited to show you about today. Uh, I started a company called Seven Million Bikes Podcast. That's a, that's a logo, yeah? That's a logo, yeah. And the reason for Seven Million Bikes is when I was starting, I just read a news article there was 7.4 million motorbikes in this city for only like 10 million people. And so I think, oh, that's a cool name. And it's now over 8 million, but the name stays the same. Uh, I wanted to show you guys around and show you how crazy this city is, how many motorbikes there are, which you can see already. It's only just turned 7 in the morning. The city wakes up at 6 a.m. There's so much energy. And so I'm going to take you around. We're going to get some coffee, some food. I'm going to show you the most dangerous district in Saigon. And but we're going to show you some of the amazing new developments as well. The city's just changing like on a daily basis, so I'm excited. Cool, I'm super excited. We've been we've been roaming around just for like three days. Motorcycles are something you can't avoid. It's insane, especially crossing the street. It feels like you're going to die every time. Yeah. It, it doesn't get old after a second. It's really really scary. I, this is one of the biggest things I heard about before coming to Ho Chi Minh was just like there are an insane amount of motorbikes. I heard the driving in Vietnam is crazy. So. I want to hop on your bike and see this firsthand. I'm super excited. Let's do it. So let's roll, baby. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we're going to do the Hajong Loop soon, so I want to... Oh, that's incredible. It's so funny because across Asia, they, they change just slightly, like, the names, right? Like, in the Philippines, I live in the Philippines. This one's called, like, a Honda uh, XRM. Oh, really? Yeah, and I don't think... Yeah. I don't see them here. So, so we're going to go there. that way. I mean, I nearly got into about five accidents just on the way here. Oh, that's reassuring. <laughs> I was like, I want to try to avoid being on a bike until I'm on the hot junk loop here. So where are you from originally? Glasgow in Scotland. Is there anything like this in, in Glasgow? No, no, no. Glasgow's too cold and wet. I used to have a bike in Glasgow. I used to go to uni every day by my bike and it's, uh, it was horrible. But most of the time in Glasgow, you're just driving a car around, right? Yeah, yeah. On the bus. This roundabout's going to be pretty crazy. we got a bus station on the right. I'm just double fisting electronic devices right now. I feel zero confidence in what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, you've probably been told that phone snatching is a thing, so... Yeah, is it? Is it true? Is, is snatching a pretty big thing here? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like the opportunistic thieves. So be careful, yeah. I mean, if you're holding your phone out like that, have you got it attached to your wrist? No. I don't have it attached, but I got a pretty tight grip. All right. Yeah, just, just, Woo! just be wary. Let's see how many we can see on one bike. Uh, the record, I think I've seen five or six. <laughs> so you can regularly see three or four, especially right now it's school time. So you might see some families of four on a bike. Wow. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's a really tight alley, though. That's what she said. Okay. <laughs> This is called a head, which is basically means a lane. This is what I think is the coolest part of Saigon is you have these main busy streets and as soon as you turn off and you're in these little hems, 
just basically in like a little neighborhood. I gotta give you props for back riding with me like this. Yeah. This is I'm a heavy boy. Yeah. This cannot be easy. You're navigating this like a champ. And we're back out. Amazing. All right, get ready for this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh my God. <laughs> that lady was heading right for us. <laughs> I'm being honest, you know what I just did? I just closed my eyes. <laughs> I was like, no. The difference is I'm driving, right? So I'm only looking forward. Scarier on the back. What's a philosophy here? It's just literally, go just go forward yeah. and don't even think about it. Yeah. You, I read about it, it's like you call it like a spoon of influence. So I'm only looking here. I'm not worried about left, right, or behind, because that someone else can, everyone's looking ahead. As soon as you look out of the way, that, as soon as you, somewhere else you're gonna get an accident. Right, I'm gonna focus on giving us directions and uh, when we get to the coffee shop we'll start filming again. It doesn't feel right. <laughs> it feels wrong on every level. Just as right, it's only like 7.15 in the morning. Like Saigon wakes up at 6 a.m. and it's Wow you look at that oncoming traffic. It's so crazy. What's your confidence level driving here now? It's a hundred Every day is like a new adventure. Like you never know what you're gonna have, what's gonna happen on the road, or is it like a predictable chaos at this point? A little bit predictable, but you. I mean, I, I think you missed it there. That guy just decided he wasn't gonna go over the bridge, so suddenly turned around. You have to be ready for the unpredictable all the time. Somebody's gonna make a, a wrong turn. Someone's gonna be driving towards you on the mobile phone, playing a video game. Like <laughs> <laughs> driving a motorbike. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. People playing video games while they're driving. Wow. Let's see if we can find someone texting while they're driving. That's common. People sit sending a text message while they're driving. I have no idea how they do it. Yeah, I mean, you can talk to anyone who's been here, you'll see uh, like the grab drivers. If there's a BM soccer match on, you'll be watching it while they're driving. Breastfeeding the baby. On the back of the bike. This is cool. Vietnam a very dangerous country from the get-go so is it is it like relative dangerous and it's dangerous just because it is the most dangerous or dangerous because I think 10 to well, 20 years ago it was one by Oh my god, so dangerous. Right. I'll be like, no, no, it's fine. So it's not like this local reputation of being really dangerous. It's actually not. And yet, we do it just so much more safe. Yeah, this, I, you know, I, there's a lot of places like that around the world where people, especially locals, will just come. So we've come to get banh mi. Yeah. Just, is it a typical Vietnamese breakfast or is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they love banh mi here. Yeah. This country is fueled on banh mi. Yeah. <laughs> banh mi and coffee. Let's get a coffee, it's early morning. <laughs> I need some rocket fuel to start my day. <laughs> Alright, so we're driving through a pretty amazing market right now. Wow, this is sweet. Seafood, fish, tight squeeze, tight, very tight squeeze. But you do have to be on your stuff right now, like you're hyper aware of everything that's going on in this tight. Yeah. I never thought about that like this. It's almost meditative because you don't can't think about anything. Get the, like, kind of mindfulness. Yeah. You're just in the zone. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought about it like that, but yeah, yeah. I'm really. There's a monk barreling towards yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say yeah, that's a monk. I do have to say everything looks really nice. Everything's super fresh. Yeah. Road rage doesn't exist here. You can't get angry. Have you had any sketchy situations before where somebody has? To be honest, no. No. no? The most I saw was uh, a little old lady aggressively honking. <laughs> That's the worst of it. That is a bit of a, I mean, I've seen a guy pull a machete out, but not because of road rage. Yeah, this YouTube video could literally be ASMR trying not to die. <laughs> <laughs> trying not to get hit by a bike. <laughs> Again, what I'm excited to show you, we'll finish up in like a really nice neighborhood. And Saigon is just at such a juxtaposition of 
things like this, super local, crazy, and then we can go somewhere where it's like just completely different. It's like I guess what you're trying to say is like it's really contrasty. Oh, huge. like you'll yeah, yeah. you'll feel like you're in a place like this, and then you can end up in like a really a bougie district. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is as local, unplanned, chaotic as it gets. Pretty much, yeah. This is cool. Is is that? And again, this is the most dangerous district in Saigon. I don't think it is. I used to walk this neighborhood all the time. Yeah, it doesn't feel very dangerous to me, but people are super friendly, super nice. Uh, coffee culture is pretty huge here, no? Come and you sit down for like a while. Yeah, locals do. I don't understand how. I don't know. Like, they have jobs and they work, and you go by a coffee shop and they'll all be like hanging out. And then you go by at 10 p.m. and there's still people hanging out. <laughs> so, what we got here? It's a bunch of chicken, right? Hey, coffee shop. It's on. Super nice. <laughs> A bunch of vegetables, some chilies, a bunch of this chicken paste. And I think this is like a chicken floss, right? Or if I had to guess, I've seen this all over Asia. It's like really thin. Yeah. Wow, it's super good. And we wash it down. So Vietnamese coffee with condensed milk. Oh, wow. It's less sweet, but it's like a nice balance. I have to be careful drinking this. I literally got a panic attack yesterday drinking coffee. <laughs> It's so strong. So we're just doing a little banh mi breakfast right now. So good. Well, luckily, Neil's also showing me that they bring you tea with your coffee. It's a Vietnamese thing. And the coffee comes with iced tea. I'll be honest, I need it right now. My mouth is on fire. I have, like these chilies in here are killing me. It's got really spicy really quick. All the Vietnamese food I've had so far has been not that spicy. But this is like, wow. I like it. I enjoy the flavor, but it is spicy. But predominantly grew robusta beans here. Right. Robusta is higher caffeine content than Arabica. So the coffee is stronger but more bitter. So that's why they add the condensed milk mm. to bring down the bitterness. The condensed milk came from the Americans, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, uh, they were with all Maybe the French, but I'm pretty sure uh, now that we take that. Uh, but there's an amazing girl in New York called Sierra in the Wind. We started a coffee company called Win Coffee Supplies. It's in Brooklyn, and she imports Vietnamese Robusta coffee beans to America and then roasts it in America. And she's changing the perception of Vietnamese coffee beans. So Vietnamese coffee is Robusta is the cheapest bean. So most instant coffee is used uses Robusta beans and Vietnamese and Vietnamese coffee has a reputation of inferior cheap coffee. Really? Yeah. Oh. But it's actually like made in the right way. It's Incredible. But because it's cheap, it's mostly used for instant coffee and it's not like, you know, Arabica is like the cappuccino. Yeah, Arabica is always considered like the more yeah, fancy. Exactly right. So she's turned it on, you know, on its head. So you should look up when coffee supply in Brooklyn. She's now just uh, been accepted in Whole Foods. So it's going to be in every Whole Foods in America, wow. Canada. You know, max out a credit card life savings to start this coffee company. But they talk about social justice and giving a voice to vegan farmers what she said was happening in america new york especially was like places trendy places were selling vietnamese coffee but it was just any coffee bean with condensed milk and then like what we we're drinking right and then selling it as vietnamese coffee and vietnam's not even the only country that adds condensed milk to their coffee so it was right. like i was taking away the voice from the vietnamese farmers because they were selling this as vietnamese coffee and it wasn't the vietnamese coffee beans so she now imports from here and it's just a really incredible story. She's been on the Drew Barrymore show. Wow. Tell me a little bit more about the story behind 7 Million Bikes. Like, you guys rent out bikes to people traveling in Vietnam? <laughs> no. Also, it's just a media company? This is going to be a really good test for your podcasting. If you can handle an interview with me while your mouth is on fire. <laughs> yeah, there's a one time I had a guy message me on Facebook asking, do I rent out bikes? And I was like, no, I was like, uh, I do comedy shows and podcasts. And so I invited him to the show, and so he came to my show that night, and I, I asked for permission before. I said, can I make fun of you for that? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I was like, I think his name was Ahmed, and I was like, Ahmed's here tonight. Ahmed's only here at the show because he messaged asking to rent a motorbike. <laughs> and I don't do that to him. It's never been an intention to... No, no, no. It's just a quirky name. Okay. Just something funny. Because when I, when you reached out to me too, you, suddenly the message was like, let me take you on the back of a motorbike. I was like, 
Oh, so this must be like a motorcycle rental company for like tourists or something. No, no, not at all. Okay. I just decided I wanted to do a podcast about Saigon initially. So initially, I was just like, yeah, a quirky play on words. I was like, oh, seven million bikes, that'll be fun. So initially it was called Seven Million Bikes, a Saigon podcast. But it kind of blew up and I started interviewing people from around the world. The main, the, everybody has to be connected to Vietnam, so it doesn't matter the race, religion, color, creed, LGBTQ. Uh, they just have to be connected to Vietnam. So I've been lucky enough to interview people in America, Switzerland, all over Vietnam. And so it grew to become from a Saigon podcast to being a Vietnam podcast. And then Seven Million Bikes became like the brand. So Seven Million Bikes does well. Did comedy shows? We're pulled back on there on those, but. Before the pandemic, we're doing lots of comedy shows. We're doing shows at the Hard Rock Cafe here. We're having like over 150 people. Wow. I'm starting to do lots of quiz nights. I even started to put on music shows um, all pre-pandemic. And then obviously that just killed it. Like, pandemic killed all of it. It killed everything, right? Yeah, yeah. So most of the venues I was doing shows at closed down. I did some online stuff during the pandemic. So this is what happened as well. I was starting, starting to do online quiz nights, online comedy shows, charging for them, getting paid money. I've been hired by companies here in Saigon to do corporate events for the staff as everything was closed. Here in Vietnam, the lockdown just ended like that, but we still couldn't really go out to bars and cafes. But nobody wanted to do anything online because they could leave the house. So my business got killed twice. I built, I started to build a presence and a business online, then that died. So I, and I couldn't do events in person, and I couldn't do events online. So I was left with nothing and it took about another six months before we could even start to do stuff in person. Even since then, that's been a couple of years now, it's still hard bringing out the crowd and the audience. Not because of the pandemic, because a lot of people left, a lot of the performers left. And you I, yourself were doing stand-up comedy yeah, as well? Yeah. You have a background from that, from like what, from Scotland no, or started here? Started here. Yeah, started, it's been a lifelong dream to do it. And then the opportunity arose here. I was at an open mic night, I had the notes in my pocket. I'd, had a, I'd done that a few times, but I'd always got too scared to go on. And then this one night, there was like nobody there. There was like one performer and the host. And the host was like, well, look, that's our show, guys. He's like, any of you guys want to give it a crack? Because I had my notes ready and it was less scary because there was only a few people there. And I got up and did it. I got some laugh and that was me hooked. So I've just been doing it ever since. Like, and it's just been, I'm not famous. I'm like, but I've been recognized a couple of times, which is cool. But I, I, I'm never wanting to be famous. Just to do comedy one time was a dream. I've now performed in the States, performed in um, all over Vietnam, in Scotland, New Zealand, Thailand. It's just an absolute dream come true. Well, for the podcast, you get recognized here in, in Saigon, like, frequently? Couple, not frequently, often. It happens. Because it has, it has a quite a bit of following, like I saw on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people watching it. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, I was in a Phu Quoc, is like an island off of Vietnam, and a girl came up to me, and she was from Scotland, which was crazy, and she's like, she, I just want to say hello. She's like, I, I, listen, I listened to your podcast before I came to Vietnam, and I recognize you from social media. She's like, I love your podcast. Super cool. This week I had somebody recognize me as well. Which was, well, not so, recognize me. So the, the online world for you right now is your full time. This is what you're doing, podcasting, like building the podcast for other people, yeah. and I then mean, touring I mean, random foreigners around exactly. on the motorbikes. I know when I saw your post, I was like, amazing. Like, I love showing people around Saigon. We, we've lived here for about the same time, seven years. I love this place. So the chance to show people around is just awesome. That's why I messaged on like, let's get on my bike and let's, uh, let's <laughs> cool, go man. through around. So I think it's time to move on. Yeah. Ready? Yeah, let's bounce. What are we going to do now? We're going to go through District 1, the main district. You can see the Batexco Tower, which has a helicopter pad on it. The Never been used. Ah, the Avengers building. Avengers yeah, building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, they built a helicopter pad on there. And the idea was meant to be the CEOs could fly in on a helicopter, land, go straight to the office. It's never been used. <laughs> if you look on the website, it says it's still to be finished. Because if someone told me they didn't account for the headwinds, and it's completely unsafe to land a helicopter oh. because it's too high and too windy. So no helicopter has ever landed on them. I have been on there. I did a, a stair climbing thing. So you like do a race to climb the stairs, it's like 50 odd floors and you get to walk on the high back. Anyway, we're going to drive there, then we're going to go over the new bridge and I was saying to you, this bridge only opened like less than a year ago. Yeah. One of the craziest, coolest things about Saigon is, you know, it's this local areas. But where we're going to go is all brand new, mm. the, the developments are just crazy, new buildings. A bridge, it sounds so silly, and I was telling one of my Vietnamese friends and she's like, where you're from, have you ever seen a bridge being built? And I was like, no, they were all built when I was born. Like, we don't see this kind of things being built. So, to me, I thought it was really cool just watching this bridge. And like, slowly appear. 
yeah. So I sound pretty lean to get excited yeah. about a bridge, but it's pretty cool. So we're going to go over that, and then the area on the other side. When I first came here seven years ago, that was just a swamp. Yeah. There was nothing there. I can show you old pictures. It was just a green swamp. We're going to go over that bridge. There's now high rises everywhere. Really? Wow. In yeah, just seven all, years. All built up. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think it's like the most valuable land in the city, the yeah. most expensive land in the city. Wow. Because it's so crazy because so there was D1 yeah. on one side, and then the other side of the river, there was nothing. Yeah. And in most cities, you know, both sides of the river are prime location. So they've now dream the swamp literally so let's go check let's go out. check it out what have been some of the struggles of living in a country like vietnam have there been many oh so many yeah i hated it here the first couple of years really i couldn't wait to leave yeah first couple of years was like i had a back injury and i had a really sore back and it's just trying to find the right treatment it was really difficult i had some crazy stories of traveling to like hospitals way out my was away and have been left abandoned in a room for an hour well like so the language bad but that's all I mean, everything really comes down to the language barrier, right? Not being able to find treatment is because I didn't know how to communicate properly or how to ask the right questions. When we first came here as well, you know, the lifestyle wasn't, our lifestyle wasn't healthy. Someone described it to me once, it's like, for expats, it's like a big college town because everyone's away from home. Right. So you go out and you party and, you, you know, I was, a, I was an English teacher at the time. Were you very connected to the expat community here? Somewhat, I don't, I don't know, very connected. Maybe more than some people, less than others, I guess. As a teacher, you don't start till like five in the evening and you work on the weekends mainly. If you're teaching English as a foreign language, that, that means you don't need to be up early in the morning. So you're just having fun. And then after a couple of years, it was like, this is not a healthy lifestyle. It's not the way I want to live my life. It's not how I live my life back home. Once you realize that you're here for the long term, you're going to try and find that bit of balance. Trying to eat a bit healthier, you can find healthy organic food. I'm trying to have like a, not a normal life, but trying to bring a bit of, I don't know the word. Wow, what a view. Yeah, this is like a financial district here. The central bank is just through here. These are all girly balls. This is like a city. Yeah. Oh, this is like the city part of yeah, town? In the, in the nighttime, this is all, these are all like girly balls. Oh, this is a cool market. We're going to buy through here. They've been rumored to close this down for years, but they've never done it yet. This is quite quiet, but some days this can be really busy. Alright, so this is really interesting. So you've got some like one of the top rated restaurants in the whole of Southeast Asia just here. Oh really? It's called Anand Saigon. And again, this is the juxtaposition of Saigon. Yeah, this market to uh, these buildings. So these places over here, oh it's up here. You're gonna see some Chinese writing. And these buildings are See, all of these are like really historical. They might tear them down, but I hope they don't. Oh yeah, you can see it. You can see the, the Chinese characters. So these are like old historical buildings. You can see it from up here better. So this is Anan. So this is one of the top rated restaurants in all of, the, all of Southeast Asia. Really? Wow, look at that building. You see like the Chinese right on the front of that building? Yeah. So that building there is like really And then it's just intermixed by these like really thin, really tall yeah, modern yeah. buildings. So the reason why they're really thin, apparently um, back in the day, you got taxed on the width of your, uh, your property or your land, but not taxed on the height, like your property tax. So the way around that was to build really thin, tall buildings. So you only pay the tax for the width of the ground floor. Apparently, that's what I've been told. So that's why in all of Vietnam, you see these really tall, skinny buildings. We have come here now to uh, the Avengers building. What is it called? What building is it? Patexco. Patexco. Yeah, yeah. Is this a corporate office building? Yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've been in a meeting up there. It's pretty cool. There's a movie theater. There's shops in the first few floors. That's why I keep seeing just a bunch of people going inside. Yeah, and then there's offices, the rest of it. Yeah. But I mean, this is a really, really, really good show of contrast between... Yeah. What's uh, it's funny because you go to a city like I don't know, like New York, right, yeah. or, or anywhere in the West, and generally those little streets and markets that we pass through, you can't really find that anymore. Yeah. yeah especially yeah. in the West and like bigger cities, but here, this is the magic of being in a city in Southeast Asia, and especially like a biggest city in Vietnam. Yeah. Is you have this, which is comparable to any big city in the world, 
And then you have uh, the fish market that we drove through. With a live fish. Well, <laughs> Literally I, on the street. That's never happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> with a live fish. Did you get that one? Yeah, I got it on camera. He's just like driving and there's a fish crossing the street. <laughs> well, this is what I wanted to show you. So let's go now. We're going to drive around. Um, this is called Win Hue Walking Street. My pronunciation is really bad. If any Vietnamese people are watching, you're going to be like, he's butchering that. I know. <laughs> I know I'm butchering it. This used to be a canal, I think. At one point, it used to be a train station. They've turned it into this beautiful walking street, so they paved it. And Vietnamese people don't like the sunshine. They're not like us white people, where we're like, let's get tanned. Vietnamese people avoid the sun. So it doesn't get busy until dark. But in the evening, this place is packed. There's like games and food and just hundreds and thousands of people walking around. But we'll drive around there. We're gonna see the Ho Chi Minh City People's Committee building, which is where the, the seat of government um, here in Saigon. They tore down most of the French colonial buildings to build beautiful skyscrapers like this. But this one they kept, so it's a beautiful old French colonial style building. So we'll drive around there. And then we're gonna go over the 2TM2 bridge, which is what I get excited about a bridge. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm really hyped for this bridge now. I, I love a good bridge. I want to ask you, we've already covered the things that have been sort of difficult about living here. Yeah. But what, like, what's your favorite part about living here in, in Vietnam, the biggest city of Vietnam? It's the energy. I, I mean, I, I just turned 40, I still feel 25. Like, the sun gets up at six, it's already warm. It's just this crazy, any, ask anyone who lives here, it's just the energy of Saigon is what draws people here. The energy doesn't stop. You drive this street at midnight tonight, there will be hundreds, thousands of people all over the place. I mean, they say New York, the city that never sleeps. They, this Saigon is the city that very rarely sleeps. It's about three hours where it gets quiet. Uh, so the energy here, the ease of life. Uh, I'm very conscious that I'm very privileged. You know, and not just because I'm a Western of this, but there's plenty of uh, very wealthy way, way wealthier than I could ever imagine. You see Porsches, Bentleys, Maseratis, all over the place. So I don't just mean I'm privileged as a Westerner, but you know, if, you have, if you're poor here, you're gonna have, it's going to be rough, and there are a lot of poor people, and there is inequality. I think the inequality is pretty stark. You know, you're going to see people rummaging through trash or cans and things like that. But we're about to pass, pass the Bentley showroom. There's a showroom for Bentley. We've got it all, we truly have it all here. Yeah, and so, um, so I, the, the ease of life here is nice. Sorry, if you look down here, you're going to see the Opera House, which is a pretty historical building. Yeah, I feel like we're in France all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, this is like the heart of the one. If you've ever read The Quiet American, that was sort of the hotel just over there. Uh, so the group group, yeah, this is. That's the Opera House. That's then. the Opera House. You want to drive by? Well, sure. Drive by. They actually, do they do opera shows there? Or is it just a government building now? No, no, they do do shows there. I, I've been there for a show. I'm not sure if they do actual opera or... How often they do opera, but they, they do this bamboo circus, which is like a Vietnamese circus circus. Which is really cool. I, cool. I interviewed the director for that, for my podcast. Oh yeah, look at this. It's like a photo shoot going on here. Yeah, they love the wedding shoot. Ah, these are wedding shoots. Yeah, they love it. Yeah, the Hotel Continental is where the Quiet American was set. So if you read that, Graham Green wrote that there. And, uh, that's the setting. So these are all the French colony buildings? Like. Yeah, yeah, they kept some of them. This is called Don Coy, but the French name was Rue Catanat, which is which is where that movie was set. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, that book was set. And this was the heart of District 1. If you read any kind of war stories, there was bombs going off nearby. There's, but this is really kind of reporters and stuff came from refuge. It was relatively safe, you know, like most, most, kind, most war. Look, growing up as a kid in America, I grew up, I grew up playing like Call of Duty and half of those games were like set in Vietnam. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I grew up with that. Well. And then like Vietnam has such a, it had such a uh, polarizing image in my yeah. brain my whole life. Oh shit, there's a protest? This is unusual. This is the people, Ho Chi Minh City People's Committee building. We had a protest. protest. Don't happen here very often. Is that allowed? Protests are allowed? You need permission. And some protests are allowed. This does really remind me of, of a financial district in New York. Yeah, really. It's got a very similar vibe, yeah, just being yeah. on the water here. Yeah. So that building straight ahead is the tallest building in Southeast Asia. Oh, that one! I've seen pictures of that building. In terms of development, like when I first came here, this was all wasteland. It really? Was up. This park is pretty new. We've been waiting for years. This only opened in the last year. Is this the bridge? This is the bridge. Oh. This is the famous bridge. But it, the bridge 
has actually really changed the city for me anyway as a, a way of getting around. Yeah, so this will be opened up about six months ago. Yeah. Oh, so this is brand new. Oh, brand new. We just got married in there. We stayed the night with this bridge and it still wasn't completed. The whole other side of here, this is what I was saying, was a swamp. A swamp and all this swamp on the other side yeah. there. Now it's uh, some of the most expensive real estate in Southeast Asia. This is all brand new. These are still coming up. These are going to be super expensive. I don't know what was there. Nothing was there. All of that, see if you can see that little building in the bottom left, that's the only one there. We were up. All of those buildings are brand new. Land no no way. Landmark wasn't there. We saw that go up. That's how much development is taking place. Yeah. In the West, you would never be able to just pull over on a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to pull over on the bridge. No problem. We come here at night. There's hundreds of lights all marked up. Wow. Yeah, you come here in the evening and there's just hundreds and hundreds of people and bikes all hanging out, enjoying the view. And you're just like, how is this allowed? Like, imagine in the west, <laughs> like, just a major bridge and everyone just parks up and hangs out. This isn't part of the Mekong River anymore, is it? It's just the Saigon River, which Saigon will River. connect to the Mekong River. It does connect back. Some, yeah. I think so. I think so, yeah. Maybe not. But wow. they're now making like green spaces, which is amazing because Saigon is so dense. And the area is all brand new, as you can see. And they're actually putting in parks, which is really cool. Like all these green spaces. All of these are brand new. These are going to be massive high rises. This has been unfinished since we got here. So really? When we first got here, we were like, oh, this is going to be finished soon. This is going to be nice. And then we realized, and it's changed hands so many times. We've got like new developers who are going to finish it. Look at that, prime real estate in the middle of the city, massive skyscraper, it's just left to rock. Please. I don't know what they're going to do. Somebody told me it's probably so weather damaged that it can't be saved. Oh really, and then I it needs know. to be destroyed. I don't destroyed. know if that's true, oh. but like, that's what somebody told me. Wow. It's just open to the, the weather, the wind and the rain. I don't know if they're ever going to tear it down or redo it or what, but like, that's the one disappointing thing. Like, look at this city developing so quickly what we're looking at right now like most of these buildings that's district one yeah and then a little bit further is district four where we just came from. and here this area that's bintan further on is district two and this is called 2tm most of the high-rise development business area is happening in this sort of semi-circle and then the rest around is like just residential yeah. or this is all the business district here everything else is residential all, all that is residential as well oh wow no, no business there. Those are all residential buildings. Yeah. Nine, nine million people. I think ten now. Ten million, million people. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. It depends like how much you count like the outside. Eight million bikes to go around. Yeah, seven point four when I started. And now, <laughs> now there's over eight million. Forty-five. Yeah. Wow. Forty-five million more bikes. Ninety million people here next year. Infants, children. That's crazy. People. Wow. So cool. Yeah, really nice. Are they super expensive? Like Western standards. Yeah, yeah, apparently the, the land prices in this area are like a really expensive These buildings are absolutely beautiful. I would live here. So you can see here, right, like this whole area looks like this. I'm into just a few minutes ago. But the trajectory is for most of this green. To go away, right? They're gonna be. This is all gonna be really, really developed. Ah, it's so nice that there's still even like a little bit of a lake in here. Uh, this is super cool. I'm, I'm really getting the perspective of of Ho Chi Minh that I didn't think I was gonna be able to get on this uh, on this motorbike trip. Wow, wow, we were. Cool, cool. This resident. is all already populated though. Like people are living in here. Oh yeah. You just have to. You don't know what's gonna happen, but you have to be ready for stuff like that all the time. Someone's gonna suddenly turn left. Suddenly, someone's going to be coming towards you. Like, you do have to be, you can never switch off. As you probably see on this video, I never stop looking forward. Like, uh, I'm constantly watching what's happening ahead of me, though. Like, I'm not looking behind me, looking to the left. That doesn't matter. Totally. That's what's <laughs> important. Wow, what a shakeup. What a difference from when we started this video, huh? Yeah. That's crazy. That's For people watching this, I feel like this is one of the biggest defining factors in living in Southeast Asia. Especially getting to experience Southeast Asia as, as a foreigner. It's just like this. Do you feel pretty safe leaving helmets here in Vietnam just yeah, on the... Really? Okay. Whenever I come to a new city, I always love to try to go to like the 
richest part of town or the most yeah. developed part of town because it gives you a good indication of what the most happy people are how they're living life in a big city here yeah you yeah. know so many this is the other myth that Vietnam is a poor country there are poor people and that's inequality right do you so feel like there's a huge wealth gap like the, if there's a big disparity of high rich society in the low yeah I mean the part of this development and it's actually fucking awesome. So me and my wife were here yesterday just for a walk around. It's just like Central Park. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's called. Yeah. But like kind of it's nicer. What, what was the tallest building in Southeast Asia before? I feel like it's not that. I mean, I, I guess it is tall. In, uh, Patronus Towers. In Malaysia. I think that was This is the taller place. than the Patronus Towers. Wow. I heard that this was the tallest one in Southeast Asia. Yeah. It kind of looks like the Burj Khalifa a little bit, like a mini Burj Khalifa. It's the, it's yeah. the tallest building in Southeast Asia. Oh, Tall, right. Tallest yeah. building? The tallest building. 461 meters. Yeah, 14th tallest in the world. Yeah. That's where we were. Wow, what a city, huh? I cannot imagine seeing this build up. Enter, right? This did not exist in such a short amount of time. Like, yeah, you moving here like like just recently, seeing this go from swamp to this. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, <laughs> feel it every day. Nice. Yeah, it's chickens. That and this. <laughs> In any other place in the West, it wouldn't be allowed. There'd probably be some sort of noise pollution yeah, law yeah, against yeah. this. But this, like, all of a sudden you see this and it reminds you where you are yeah, yeah. for a minute. Of, but it also drives you crazy here. Like, it drives you crazy. Like, so that energy and all of this stuff, you need to be able to leave. This is, again, a privileged Westerner. You need to be able to get out of Saigon. And that was why the pandemic was really difficult because we were trapped here for three years. So we could leave Saigon sometimes, not all the time, but and travel around Vietnam. Well, we didn't leave Vietnam and mostly Saigon for three years. It's really mentally tough because it's it's a tough place. The pollution, the traffic, the trash, yeah. the craziness. You need to be able to get out. So when the pandemic's kind of settled down now, I guess it's over and we've been able to travel internationally, go home. You just love that because you'll be able to kind of breathe a little bit. Right. Like, oh. But then you come back to Saigon and you're like, yes, this place is so fun. It's so I love cool. the energy yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the development. How do you feel about it? I mean, like, look, I, I, I totally understand how, like, as foreigners, it's not like we're not allowed to have an opinion on this stuff, but like sometimes people will shun you. It's like, hey, if you don't like it, leave. Oh my goodness. That's but you said in the expat groups here all the time. Yeah, if but you see anything critical, people are like, if you don't like it, go back uh, to your home country. Like, you're not allowed an opinion. I know being an expat who lives in the place that's not a place I was born into, but I have so much love for the place that I live, yeah. where I built my house in the Philippines. I feel like maybe I don't have to share those opinions all the time, but like I do hold opinions about yeah. the place that I live in. But like, how do you actually feel about the development of this place? Do you do you think that it will go and get ruined, or do you think it'll get too out of hand? Maybe this you'll outgrow the place yeah. in the future. So it's weird because I, I like to think of myself as a bit of an environmentalist, and I definitely have an environmental core. Try and do no harm, try and use as little as I can. But being here, like development, I kind of welcome it because. I mean, I, I'm probably completely wrong in my viewpoint, but it cleans it up. Like, look at this river below us, look at this river bank. You know, it's clean and it's neat and it's tidy, whereas other places in the river, it's just filled with trash and it's gross. And So I've seen development here do good things, like this beautiful park. Okay, it's manicured and it's fake and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm sure I'm in the wrong, <laughs> but I've also seen development for good. Like, it's making the place cleaner and nicer, but it's probably not, because before it was nice green swamp natural and biological and now we have all these ugly concrete towers so overall it's probably a bad thing but in reality it is doing good it's cleaning it up it's creating jobs there's so much jobs here people the, the reduction in poverty here is just insane the reduction in poverty of course like yeah i mean wealth is just insane like i mean these people that are living in these buildings some of them in my building alone it's just audi audi mercedes maserati Massive. And not necessarily expats, like but Vietnamese no expat, people. Zero expats. I don't know any expat who owns or even drives a car. Every car is a Vietnamese. Yeah, they're all so loaded and making things happen, owning companies, starting companies. That's again like another cliche that like foreigners come over here and you know they're able to take advantage colonial style and start new businesses. And yeah, sure, they do. And, and 20, 30, 40 years ago, that definitely happened. But everything here now is Vietnamese driven. Everything's Vietnamese owned. Everybody who's wealthy I've ever seen, it. anyone who's in a nice car is Vietnamese. The wealthier people being pulled out of poverty, you know, my wife teaches at an Australian university. We teach at a language school. The kids that come to that school are from wealthy families. You know, they've got MacBooks, iPhone 14s, they get dropped off in Bentleys. They've come from money. 
and it's amazing. It's not. It's not this poor country. And it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's not, not a bad at all. Having a wealthy society in your country is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it shows that something is moving in the right direction. Inequality is bad in every country, and we obviously we as a we. But in general, people seem pretty happy. The fed, they've got shelter, they got water, they got you know the needs are met. Obviously, there are homeless people, but not huge. Not like America, you know. It's got yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowhere near. Nowhere but I, near. I would go to say that I think generally the rule follows that a lot of people in Southeast Asia have a different mentality. A lot of people in the West oh, do, sure, yeah. and like even in complete poverty-stricken situations, they're able to put a smile. And I'm not saying this in like a weird foreigner. I, know, I love right? everybody so happy because that's not the, that's not the truth. People work hard, and people have hardship, and they have a hard life. But it's a different mentality. I think maybe a hard life has been following a lot of these people for so long, for generations, that it's just kind of a custom. Like, it's like, we don't have another option but to put a smile on our face and keep trucking on and keep moving forward. And that's how you have things like this develop with a population who also lives in complete poverty. But it's not like, I don't know, I don't, you don't feel it. Maybe it's just because no. we're foreigners, but you don't feel like huge divide in happiness. I feel like every Vietnamese person I've interacted with so oh, far yeah, yeah. has yeah. been completely wonderful and yeah, super, yeah. super nice. All right, so we're leaving this insanely beautiful developed area. Uh, and because we're in such an amazing country for street food, we're gonna go get some more street food. One of the good things is when they want to get things done in Vietnam, they do it. So like five, six years ago, they were like, we want to create our own car industry. So they just imported all these engineers and technicians from Germany and literally created VinFast in a year. Wow. They created their own car company in literally like a year, right? Electric car company. No, they started off with... Uh like regular cars yeah. and now, now they're just focusing on electric cars. I think Oh, I but this looks like a regular is this a regular this car? Is this is Vinfast, this yeah. V is Vinfast. Oh this is yeah. regular. This That's a regular car? That's an electric. <laughs> the, the, like, the cars. Yeah. So they're, they're just on electric now. And then you have like a charging station here. Just as if this was Tesla. You got the this same is, uh, Tesla VNM. VNM don't wait for other people they're like oh we'll just do it ourselves yeah, and yeah. so they get ahead of it tesla will probably never be a big thing here. yeah yeah because they didn't fast did it first and they do it like that mm. so, like we want a car industry they will make a car I industry think, like locals are quite proud Oh, of course. Vin cars, yeah. You know, it's made in Vietnam, so they want to. And then the same company, Vinfast, owns this mall. Yeah, yep. the whole thing. And all Vin the Hospital, Vin Group, yeah. Vin Mix, yeah. Vin School. Yeah, this area, because this has the Vin School and the, the Vin Hospital. Yeah. Uh, so it's like its own ecosystem. They started off as a noodle company in Ukraine. A noodle company? A two minute yeah, noodle company. Noodle. Instant noodle company yeah, in Ukraine. Like what they're 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 now, huh? One of my favorite things about traveling Southeast Asia has been the sugar cane juice. 20,000 dong, 40, 40 cents. So hydrating, so hot right now. So hot. It literally, uh, Neil's idea was like, we need to do this video early in the morning. It warned me the second we got on the bike, you got about an hour before it just becomes a sweat show. And it literally, <laughs> oh, like so hot. And you were saying the government school has like 50 students per class. That's a lot of students. They'll have like four or five classes per grade. They'll have just schools next to each other, left, right, and center. There's, it is one of the youngest populations in the world, Vietnam. It really bodes well for the future. Like, I don't know the stats, but like 30% of the population is under 25 or something like that. Like, so many young people, this generation, like, so connected to the world, so tech, tech savvy. We're all learning English from five years old and younger. The Independence Palace now is a museum, but this is the center of Saigon. You left the heavily fortified American embassy there. But what we're driving up right now is historic. This is where the tanks rolled up and knocked down these gates. You can find those pictures. Then we got a really nice mall next to us. We're going to drive up here where the tanks rolled in, then we're going to come and see here. This is the Notre Dame Cathedral. We imagine April 30th, 1975. Saigon was penetrated, the tank rolled up here, this was the seat of power. Uh, they in the north won the war and Saigon became, uh, Vietnam became one country, controlled by the north, the Americans left. But so on my podcast I've interviewed a lot of um, children of old people, like this was the start of a lot of people fled Vietnam either on the day the tanks rolled through or soon after they escaped on fishing boats. Yeah. It would have been dangerous for the ones who were aligned with America, right? Absolutely. To stay here after the yeah. fact. So that's been one of the most interesting parts of my podcast. I've been interviewing children of boat people, or actual boat people. One of my guests, her family fled on April 30th. She was only five years old. They escaped to Hong Kong. They had like no food, no water. The guy next to her shot himself in the head. She was only five years old. He killed himself. Yeah, so it's kind of sad to see history repeat itself 
even now, like 50 years later. And that's been one of the one of the highlights of my podcasting. So this is normally a beautiful cathedral. It's the Notre Dame Cathedral. Construction was meant to finish a month after it started. I think it's been like this for two or three years now. You recommend people to do Saigon by bike? Absolutely, yeah. 100%. Super cool that Neil's uh, literally taking me around as as a tour guide today. Even though he's not a tour guide, just helping me out by showing me the city. You can see how beautiful this building is. Dude, you are the MVP of riding around in Saigon. That was, uh, that was killer. <laughs> what an adrenaline I'm rush. Not, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> That's as long as I've driven about Saigon in one Woo! You gotta be like on edge the entire time. Like it's literally, you gotta be hyper aware. It's gotta be like, your brain's gotta be fried after something like this. Okay, I did want to ask you, considering you have so much knowledge about this city and the area, like what's what's your long-term plans in Vietnam? Do you think, is this home? Are you staying here forever? Do you know? I came here for seven weeks. And I ended up staying for three months and then three months became six months, six months became a year. A year became two, then we had a pandemic. Two became four became seven so i have no idea what the future holds home right now and i love it here the problem is like um vietnam doesn't offer a long-term plan for residency or for or living here you have to renew your visa in thailand and other southeast asian countries they don't even offer like a retirement visa so without any like long-term residency plan like just logistically it's almost impossible to be like i'm gonna be here for the rest of my life you just don't know because i just don't know so i could be is the answer but i don't know we'll see how it goes i probably don't think so like we mentioned the pollution and the traffic the trash is they're massive problems but you know the longer we've been here and we've gone back to other countries but like these countries aren't perfect either we lived in new zealand before here and we love new zealand more than anywhere it's clean and it's green and it's beautiful but it's also really far away and it's expensive and it's at least not warm and beautiful like this. So everywhere has its ups and downs. Vietnam's home for right now, probably for the next couple of years. And after that, we'll just see what happens. Before we end up the video, where can everybody find you and your work and what you got going on? Yeah, the best thing, just go 7millionbikes.com. Seven, S-E-V-E-N, seven millionbikes.com. You can find all my podcasts on there. I do an online podcast course. So if you want to start your own podcast, you can do that from anywhere in the world. If you want to work with me, I can help you develop your own podcast for business or for pleasure. Um, so that's the biggest thing, and uh, yeah, can do. I can work. I work already with clients all over the world, so it's, uh, we live in a globalized world, right? So uh, check me out on sevenmillionbikes.com. Obviously on Instagram, YouTube, social media, all of that stuff. Thank you so much, though. This has been so much fun. Yeah, man. I do love Saigon, and to be able to take you around and show you this crazy, crazy city has been so awesome. Well, thank you, brother. It was a pleasure meeting you. I'll leave links down below in the description for everything. And thank you as well, man. Yeah. It was super fun. No and Moshe, you I'll can go. go. You can go away. Thank you. We'll see you guys in the next one. I love you a long time. Goodbye, class. <laughs>